Hi and welcome to another Retronaut video. So, this video is a continuation of the Fujitsu Ergo Pro X453 video where I received that machine. Um, it was from a, a computer company that I used to work for here in the UK. Um, they were called ICL when I worked for them. Um, they were later rebranded as Fujitsu. And um, I really wanted one of those machines because when I worked at that company, they were really nice uh, IBM PCs of their era. And uh, they were quite expensive. They were generally sold to a lot of corporations, large companies, and they were just way outside of my price bracket. So I, I had an aspiration all this time to get one of those machines, and finally I managed to get one. The only problem was it was in pretty bad condition cosmetically, lots of scratches, lots of marks on the outside, so I needed to clean the machine. When I looked inside, it was pretty dirty. Um, so in this video that I'm going to play now, you're going to see that uh, I plan to uh, get the machine clean, uh, by washing the logic board and other elements. Okay, so the next stage is I'm going to take these things, the logic board, the case, um, the, the chassis um, elements, and I'm going to wash them in warm water. Might use a bit of detergent as well, just to get um, any um, sort of nasty dirt off. Once I've finished, I will then rinse them very, very uh, thoroughly to make sure there's no detergent left, and then I will use an electric blower. Um, it's quite, you, it actually has quite high pressure, so it should actually get all the dirt out. Um, but that's the technique I use. There's nothing rocket science about it. Obviously, these then need to be bone dry before we plug them back in. Um, otherwise, you might have a, obviously a major electrical problem. So at the end of that video, uh, I had all of these items washed. I then made sure that I, I dried them thoroughly, and I used a compressed air gun for that. And the reason for that is if you have any uh, slots like this, if you have any microchips which are quite flush to the actual logic board, then obviously water can get trapped under there. And because of capillary action, um, if the gap is small enough, um, it can get trapped under there really, yeah, really good. If you turn the machine sideways, it's not going to just flow out because it's actually got a, a sort of suction between the chip and the logic board surface. So with a compressed air gun, you can blow underneath the chip and you'll actually see streaks of water coming out until you see nothing. And then what I do is I chase those uh, sort of like uh, strings of water until I blow them off the edge of the logic board go all the way around the entire logic board until eventually you don't see any more streams of water coming from anywhere and you can tell that the board's actually completely dry. Obviously when I do this, the memory would be unplugged, the CPU would actually be taken off the board, you know, the, um, the heatsink would be removed and the, the CPU would be put to one side. The CPU itself doesn't need to be washed, washed or, or the heatsink. So that's all put to one side to make sure that you haven't got any sort of places where water can get trapped. So yeah, once I did that, Everything was completely dry, and then to make sure I left the machine uh, to air dry for a couple of days. That's just to make sure that there's not any sort of residual moisture hanging around. As far as the power supply is concerned, it's a little bit dodgy actually. Um, let me just unplug it. Um, it's not actually plugged in on the other end right now. Um, it's a little bit dodgy because when you take it out of the machine, um, this is actually facing towards the edge of the, the side of the machine, which has a lot of venting. So it's a good design in that way, actually. It sucks in air in through here, and then uh, air vents out through the entire side of the machine. So it's a really good design in that respect. It's going to keep this really cool. Unfortunately, when you take it out of the machine, this entire area is exposed. So that's a bit dodgy. Um, and when I was working on it, I did actually get a shock. Um, weirdly, I touched in this area. I don't really quite know how I managed to get a shock, so it's quite weird. Um, when you're using it, you actually have to press this button here at the front. So yeah, I was always a little bit um, nervous when I was using this. When we uh, get this machine back together, I have to put a fan on here. This is the fan. It's a Noctua, which I've already uh, adapted to work here. And uh, there are these two little rubber nipply things at the top, and they're meant to go through the holes on the fan. Uh, unfortunately, the two bottom ones broke off when I uh, removed the old fan, which I thought was dead. Now. Having adapted this fan, I plugged it into this uh, socket here. There's a fan header here. And this is the fan header for the CPU fan, which was still working. And when I plugged this fan into the CPU header here, it was working as well. When I plugged it into the fan header in the, P in the power supply, which is actually right in the middle of the log logic board in there, there's actually a fan header in there, right there, very difficult to get to, and it didn't work. So 
It looks like the fan, which I had with the machine originally, was possibly working, but it wasn't working because the fan head is broken for whatever reason. However, on the logic board, there is actually a uh, fan header here. So I tested out this fan with this fan header and it works. So I've got what I need. I've got two fan headers, one which I can use for the uh, power supply cooling. And I've got another fan header here, which will be used to cool the uh, CPU and also the linear uh, voltage regulator, which is uh, like a small star in terms of the amount of heat that it puts out. It's absolutely crazy how hot this thing is. Now then, uh, how did I then test out the machine? I'd washed it. There's the potential for things to go slightly south uh, if you do that, even if you're very careful, you never know. Um, so what I did was I didn't put the, the CPU, CPU back in just in case there was an electrical fault. And I didn't put the uh, memory back in for the same reason. I plugged the uh, power supply back in using a photograph to make sure that I got the orientation of all these power plugs correct, because you never know, um, you could get it wrong. But luckily these are actually keyed, so you can't really put these in wrong. Um, every one of these is keyed and they, they only actually plug into one place. So that's great, really good design there, whoever did that. Um, so when I, once I got that plugged in and I tested the fan, um, I kept the fan plugged in because that would then allow me to know that there was some kind of power going to the machine. When I was testing the fan, uh, there was something weird going on because I was getting multiple beeps um, and that's probably an error. So I was a bit worried about that. Um, I actually went on the web and tried to find uh, the manual and uh, it was quite tricky to find, but eventually I found it on a website called Yumpu. And Yumpu had done something really naughty with the, the, um, the manual. They, they basically got hold of it, did some really good quality scans, which is all great. Uh, then they put it into their own little sort of web app and then they put it behind a sort of advert wall. So it had adverts smothered all over it. And I thought, well, that's okay because I'll be able to download it as a PDF. No. They decided that this was now their manual, even though it's obviously the Fujitsu uh, intellectual property, and uh, you couldn't actually download the manual from that website. So I've got to say, uh, Yumpu was very naughty. So I was just as naughty, and I went into their code, and I found where the images were referenced, and I referenced every image by hand, which took me a good hour, and I downloaded every single page of the manual, made it into a PDF using an online tool, and I now have that PDF, which I'm in the process of sharing with some reference websites so that um, that PDF and also some other material is now available for everybody to get. And that's just in case, well, the manual I never found anywhere else, but that's just in case any other files to do with this machine um, are lost for whatever reason. So I'm trying to make sure that this machine, and I think there's a small family of about four machines which share a lot of material. Uh, they obviously must have come out at the same time, part of the same sort of family. So I went to the page in the manual where it explained BIOS um, postcodes. It wasn't that actually that I needed. And then it was on another page and it said there were two different sets of beeps that it, you could have. You could either have four beeps or you could have, I think it was five beeps or eight beeps. Um, but anyway, this was a four beep sequence. And it was, as far as I remember, beep, beep, quick beeps and two long beeps. So dot, dot, dash, dash. And I checked what that was and it said that it was a problem addressing the base memory of the machine. And I thought to myself, well, it must be a problem with the RAM. Um, I haven't got any RAM plugged in, so that's why it's complaining about RAM. So at that point, I thought to myself, that's perfectly logical. I took the RAM, I plugged it in, I turned the machine on, and it didn't make any beeps whatsoever, and nothing happened. I had the monitor plugged in, in the VGA port here, nothing, completely black screen, and I thought to myself, well, you know, it's obviously working because it's ma not making any moaning noises, no beeps, nothing. It must be working. So I had a good fiddle around with the monitor and I actually have another VGA monitor off camera. It's a Hewlett Packard monitor. Tried that as well, nothing. The monitor just didn't show any signal come in. There was nothing coming from this machine whatsoever. At that point, I was basically dead in the water. The machine didn't seem to have any trauma. I couldn't see anything wrong with it whatsoever, but it just didn't work. If I took the RAM out, it made a noise. Beep, 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 beep. Give me some RAM. You put the RAM in, nothing, nothing whatsoever. I don't know if you've watched any other channels where people work on PCs, but there's a piece of hardware that people use called a postcard, I think it's postcode analyzer. And uh, it's a bit of a confusing name because uh, in this country, postcode means um, the address that you're at. It's like a zip code in America. It's a short sequence, alphanumeric sequence that basically gives you a unique 
uh, location for your street. So I was telling my friend about this. I said, I need to get a postcard analyzer. And he was like, postcard analyzer. And he was like, why do you need an analyzer for postcodes? And then eventually I twigged that, you know, he didn't understand what I was talking about. And I said, no, 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 I need one of these. I also described it as a postcard, which it is. It's for analyzing postcodes. It's a postcard. Um, same thing, quite confusing. So uh, this is the car that I'm talking about. You've probably seen these. They're quite ubiquitous. They're actually really quite cheap. I think I bought this for £12. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a companion video that goes along with this video. And that companion video is going to show you exactly how this card works and why it's so useful. I learned about these cards from other channels. And um, I knew that without this card, I wasn't going to tell anything about this machine. Now, that isn't guaranteed because if the machine has a lower level fault, for instance, if the CPU is broken or if uh, there are other problems, the codes which can be displayed on here can be dash, 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 dash. And that means there are no postcodes. So you can't tell what's actually wrong with the machine. You could actually be back at uh, ground zero again. Anyway, uh, without the card, I wouldn't actually know um, anything. So I, I ordered one of these off eBay. And it looked like it was going to take four days, but it did actually turn out in the end to take over a week because the vendor was a little bit naughty. And there's this practice on eBay where people say they've posted something, but in fact, all they've done is register it with their postal service that they are going to post it. And then they take, they take their sweet old time about it. And I think they actually really posted this on Thursday. So yeah, that was a bit naughty. Um, in the meantime, I had to work out what you know, what was wrong with this machine. I couldn't just sit on it and just sit there and see what's, you know, what exactly is going on here. So what other, what other tools did I have uh, to look at this machine? I do have a multimeter. And with a multimeter, I can check voltages. I can see if voltages are going into various chips. I also have a oscilloscope, uh, 25 megahertz oscilloscope. And with that, I can check to see if I have activity on the CPU, if there is activity on certain chips, and you know, quite complex activity. You can see uh, signals, things going high and low, so on and so forth. So I did actually have a couple of tools which I could use to try and work out what's going on this machine. Now I should say at this point in the video, I am a complete novice with uh, PC repairs. I've never repaired a PC at all, anywhere at any time. And also I have actually repaired uh, Amigas. And one of the differences between like say for instance, a 1980, 80s Amiga and this, this computer is that uh, the BIOS is different. The ROMs, the basically the system ROMs are different in a Pentium. This is a Pentium area machine. And the uh, chips, uh, some of them have a very fine pitch compared to most of the Amigas. The later ones, not so much, the Amiga 4000. Um, and obviously it's a completely different architecture. <laughs> Apart from that, I knew everything. Yeah, so in other words, I, I knew nothing. Um, there was a manual for it. There was no schematic for the logic board, unfortunately. Even the manual didn't show a schematic. It just showed uh, a diagram, which I actually showed you in the last video. So I didn't really have that much information, really. Um, so what would be the next stage that I would actually do to try and check things? What I would do next is I would check the voltages. I looked at the voltages on various chips. And I could see, using the multimeter, that the voltages were good, that there was continuity on all the main chips with ground. And to be fair, I didn't really know how many chips I had to check. I mean, there are a lot of chips on this machine and um, any one of them could have had a fault with this power supply. So the main thing I was checking really was, did some of the chips have the correct voltages that they should have? Because if some of them do, then they probably all do. Obviously, one of the legs on the chips could have been raised off the board. That can happen. Um, and if that did happen, obviously, that would cause a fault. But obviously, you know, without knowing what the problem was, I didn't really want to go around every single chip on the board and treat it like it was faulty and that it had dodgy connections. So I ascertained that the voltages were correct. The next thing was, was the CPU running? I used a bit of logic for that because if you think about it, the BIOS, which is a piece of software, it can't run unless there's a CPU. How can I tell if there's a BIOS working? Well, because it made some beeps. If I didn't put the RAM in, it made beeps, telling me that I hadn't put RAM in. When I put the RAM in, it stopped. It didn't do anything else, but it stopped. And that meant that the CPU must be running, and there must be some kind of BIOS, because if there's no BIOS and there's no CPU, 
it's not going to detect that RAM and it's not going to stop. What else can I tell as well? Well, I looked through the codes. There's lots of different postcodes that come with this machine. And many of them are to do with testing the RAM. It's actually quite thorough. It, it tests if the RAM is there, tests if the, ta uh, the RAM is valid, it floods it with uh, values and it reads back the values. And it goes through a number of tests before it actually um, goes on to the next stage. So as far as I could see, the basic RAM tests were working and it didn't find any problems. So I decided that as far as I was concerned, this RAM was okay. So we've got a machine where we have a decent power supply. The rails have all been checked to see if we've got the voltages going in and we have. I then thought, okay, maybe the CPU has a problem. Maybe it's running at the wrong speed or it's a bit flaky or something like that. So using my multimeter, I measured the voltages on the linear regulator here. I read up about this and this is a, I think it's a transistor. What it does is it takes in higher voltages. I think in this case, it's 12 volts and it regulates it down to the voltages that the CPU needs. And this gets incredibly hot. Uh, it's by design, that's why it has a metal heatsink on it. And um, I've got to say, I was shocked how hot it gets. I don't have a th uh, thermometer, one of those video thermometers, but I'm guessing it's about 90 degrees because I didn't physically burn my finger on it. But I think if I had held my finger there for a while, I would have actually hurt my finger, would have burnt it. Um, but that's normal, believe it or not. I then needed to ascertain whether the power supply was correct in the CPU. So I took the CPU off um, and that's quite easy to do. You just unclip the, uh, there's two, there's a very simple clip here and then that just lifts off and you can take the CPU out. And I looked up on the uh, CPU pinout, which of the pins actually uh, show the power supply. Now, an interesting thing about the Pentium, MMX Pentium, I should say, is that it actually has two different power supplies. Now I'm doing this from memory, so bear, bear with me if I get this wrong. But this machine, as far as I remember, the internal uh, core of the CPU runs at 2.8 uh, volts. And then the external uh, communication aspect of the chip runs at 3.3 volts. And I think it's actually the linear uh, regulator here that actually uh, gets you one of those different voltages. There are a set of jumpers here just by the CPU and they actually allow you to choose what the voltages are going to the CPU. So I checked with my multimeter what the voltages were, and I found that they were wrong. So I thought, okay, got a bit of a smoking gun here. There's something wrong with the CPU. But then I watched some other people's videos and I found that in fact, the voltage being wrong is correct if it's not under load. So I thought, okay, I need to measure it with the actual CPU back in. It's quite easy to measure the voltage actually on a Pentium because uh, it runs around almost the entirety of the outer edge of the chip. There are so many different places where voltage actually goes into this chip, it's crazy. So you can basically run along the top edge here and I believe on this side it would be 2.8 volts and on this side it was 3.3 volts. So I checked those, they're definitely wrong. I plugged the Pentium back in. This was a bit, little bit awkward. I put the um, heatsink back on, turned the machine over lay it on its back like this, ran the machine again. Obviously I needed to now test these pins here, which would be obviously the same as these pins here, the top pins. And I measured the voltages and they were 2.8 volts and 3.3 volts. So it turns out that without the CPU plugged in, you do get the wrong voltages. When it's plugged in, it was fine. So the CPU seemed to be getting the right power supply. What I had to do next was I had to determine whether the CPU was getting the right clock signal. I checked across the board and I found numerous chips, which I then went online and tried to find the data sheets for. And I downloaded those and I put those in a folder, a project folder. And then I looked near the um, dim slots here and I found this chip here is actually the clock generator for this machine. So the first thing I did was I checked to see uh, if it had ground and if it had the right voltage coming in, and it did. And then using my 25 megahertz oscilloscope, I then checked to see what the frequencies were coming out of, the, of this uh, chip. I don't know if you can see it, but right next to it, there is a oscillator, a crystal oscillator, and that runs at a certain speed. So the way the Pentium works is, all, pretty much all of the frequencies in this machine are driven by that clock. There is another clock over here, I think this might be used for input output. 
Um, but basically, most of the clocks are done over here. That clock uh, can be doubled, tripled, etc., to give you the, the clocks for this machine. This machine has USB at the back. So I checked online and I could see that USB had its own frequencies. And in the data sheet for this chip, it had two pins coming out, which would supply the clocks for a set of USB ports. And those speeds were 24 megahertz and 48 megahertz. Also, there were two pins which showed the input frequency. So I measured those to make sure that they were the same as the crystal oscillator, and I could see that they were. So that's good. Input was coming in. That proved that the crystal oscillator was running at the right speed, because that obviously can fail. It wasn't failed in my case, because we, we knew the CPU was running, right? It had some kind of activity. And I could see that the clocks were the right speed and that they were coming into the chip. So it had the right inputs. I measured the first USB frequency, 24 megahertz, and it was 24 megahertz. Wonderful. I checked second one, 48, and it was 43. So that's weird. Why is it 43? I then checked the other pins the majority of which actually output the front side bus speed for this particular CPU. And on a Pentium, it needs a clock speed of 66 megahertz for it to run. It then multiplies that value a number of times to arrive at its actual running frequency of 233 megahertz. So I thought to myself, well, you know, if that is slightly wrong, um, as I saw the USB frequency being, then that would obviously cause the Pentium to run strangely maybe, you know, misoperate or something. So I checked the frequency and instead of it being 66, it was 33. So obviously, you know, half the speed that it should be. But now I ran into a problem because how am I supposed to know if that's correct? Because I'm using a 25 megahertz os oscilloscope. The reason why I have a 25 megahertz oscilloscope is because I've only bought one recently and I actually bought it for use on a, an Amiga 4000. That has a clock speed of 25 megahertz. So I thought, you know, that's gonna be a good enough oscilloscope for that machine, and it's gonna work for any machine from the 1980s pretty much, because none of those machines ran at particularly high speeds. All of a sudden, I'm in the Pentium era, and I don't need an oscilloscope to measure the uh, running frequency of the uh, Pentium itself, but I do need to know that the front side bus is actually running at the right speed, Otherwise, it's not going to run correctly. And I've got a 25 megahertz oscilloscope, and it's trying to measure 66, and it's showing 33. But at the same time, it was showing uh, 24 correctly, which is just underneath, and it was showing 33. So I was thinking, well, 33 is more than 25. You know, it shouldn't really be able to measure anything about to, above 25 megahertz, as far as I could tell. But I sought the guidance of a few people on Vogons, and I said, you know, is it normal that an oscilloscope can measure values above its rating? And they said, yes. Uh, it has some kind of tolerances, and it can go above its rating. But a few people said that they felt that if it went way too high, it would probably start to um, report, you know, instead of every single frequency, every second frequency, every second wave. Uh, so that would mean that instead of it measuring 66 megahertz, it would show it as 33. And that would make sense, right? Because that's what I was seeing. The other thing that was weird was that the 48 megahertz uh, signal was showing up as uh, 43, I think it was. So that was a bugger. <laughs> now I knew that not only did I need one of these postcard analyzer cards, but I also needed a new oscilloscope. This is just after buying a new oscilloscope. Um, so I thought to myself, well, you know, I can sell on the 25 megahertz oscilloscope, but I still didn't know whether this machine was actually broken because of the CPU. I mean, it could be a complete red herring, right? But I'm just going through the motions of trying to check out what's going on with this machine. I should say, at this point, I already had gone through the usual test, which is touching all the chips and making sure that none of them were red hot or, or even, you know, overly warm. None of them were overly warm. Everything seemed to be fine, except for this, the linear regulator. As I said, that's like a small uh, room heater. So um, that's normal, but everything else on the board didn't get super hot. CPU gets hot, warm, not super hot, but warm, but that's normal as well, right? A Pentium era uh, CPU would actually get quite hot. That's why it's got a heatsink on it. So that's perfectly normal.
So it's been a week and I've been working on this machine and there's a knock on the door and the uh, postcard analyzer turns up. So in the next section, we're going to look at what happened when this turned up. So we've been waiting around, uh, waiting for this card to arrive, the postcode analyzer. And um, it comes with a few other bits and bobs, which we've talked about in the uh, previous video in this series. Um, this is the external screen breakout, which is quite useful. Um, I don't actually need it in this particular scenario. And here you've got a little cable, which allows you, uh, if you have a um, speaker header, you can actually connect it to this board uh, so it can give beeps. That's in case you don't actually have a, you know, a speaker on the motherboard or if it's broken, let's say. Anyway, none of that really applied to me, but I had to plug this in. So for that, um, I needed to have the uh, riser card plugged in. So let's just plug that in here. There we are. And then I needed to insert this card. Now, what's a little bit confusing, and I go over this in the video, is that there are two edges, one for ISO and one for PCI. And I didn't really understand that. So yeah, I had to look up some information on that. And uh, you've got your PCI at the top and you've got your ISO at the bottom. So if I plug that in here, there we go. That now gives me the setup that I need to actually get some better diagnostics about this machine. At this point, there is obviously the scenario that I press the power button, it turns on, and uh, I get basically dash, 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 dash across the LED displays. And that would be horrible because that would mean that there's a very low level uh, error on this board, something wrong with the, you know, the CPU or maybe the RAM's balked. But as we discussed earlier in this video, I don't really think that's gonna be the case because we take the RAM out and we get beeps. Uh, that indicates that the CPU is running um, we plug the RAM in, it does something, but then it goes quiet. There's nothing on the screen. Uh, but we know that's it's pretty likely that something is happening, although it's a bit weird that it doesn't make any beeping noises. You know, normally we'd kind of expect that. So what I did was to get back to a baseline was I wanted to see what happened when I took out um, the RAM and then turned on the machine. Um, I knew that I would get those beeps, uh, you know, the uh, the fast two beeps and then the dashes, the longer beeps. Um, but I didn't know what would happen in terms of uh, postcodes. Would I get any postcodes that went along with that? So anyway, let's have a look now what happened when I had the RAM unplugged and uh, we turned the machine on. Uh, let's see what happened on this display here. there was life in this machine. We were getting some kind of postcodes and that was really, really good. Um, that showed that really there was probably not such a difficult path to getting this machine back on its uh, feet again. So if we go into the manual and we have a look at what that code means, um, as I discussed earlier, I believe that that code means that it basically doesn't have any RAM. That makes perfect sense because we haven't put any RAM in. So what I did then was I turned off the machine, plug the RAM back in, turn the machine back on again uh, to see what would happen with the postcodes again. And uh, let's quick, take a quick look at actually what happened uh, when we had the RAM plugged in. So yeah, it's different. We've got some slightly different codes. Now, as I explained in the last video, the code to the right is the previous code and the, the code to the left on the left-hand screen, that's actually the last code that this machine ran before it ran into a problem. And the way to think about these postcodes is that uh, they're a sequence that the machine runs through. So you can expect that, you know, the first code would be zero, it does something, one, it does something. Not every single code is actually represented, uh, you know, numerically. Um, some codes are missing. And unfortunately, some of the codes which are actually uh, displayed by this card are not actually present in the manual. Um, so yeah, that was a bit of an issue. But anyway, we ended up with this code, which was 61. So if you look in the manual for this machine, code 61 says, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, it says decompressing the BIOS. And that's it. So um, it was decompressing the BIOS. I didn't really know what that meant. Um, previously, I've only really worked with Amigas. Um, on Amigas, there's no decompression of the BIOS. Um, in those cases, that, that those machines have ROMs. 
Uh, whatever's read out of ROM is basically, it's accessed directly by the CPU. So that's about it really. So what I needed to do was get together with the Vogon gang and uh, ask for some information on how this kind of machine works. Um, so I did actually go on Vogon. So I posted another message about the fact that I was um, at a bit of a loss as to what that meant, you know, decompressing the BIOS, what did that mean? And uh, luckily one of the users there, Jan, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it, he's Dutch. Uh, he, he came on, or maybe it's a lady, I'm not sure. Um, he came on and um, they explained to me in quite a lot of detail how the BIOS actually works in a Pentium era uh, machine. I also had a look at the data sheet. Um, so this is actually the BIOS here. This is the BIOS chip. And then there's another chip over here, which is a static RAM chip. Uh, this stores up to 32K. And the BIOS chip here stores 256K. And um, I'll try and remember what Jan uh, explained to me. He said that by this point, BIOSes were actually quite a bit, you know, quite a lot more complex and they needed a lot more instructions than they used to back in the Amiga days. And uh, that's why this chip is actually 256K. If you read the spec sheet about this chip, it says that it has a, uh, a small amount of static RAM, 32K, and that is where uh, the boot ROM goes, uh, the boot C uh, BIOS, I should say. And um, Jan was saying that what that is, is that it's a very low level basic BIOS that shouldn't really change. Um, even if the BIOS were, were to be changed on this machine, that really doesn't need to be changed. And that should contain very, very basic tests, like does the RAM work? Do the floppy drives work and things like that. And the reason why this machine needs like a test for the floppy drives at such an early stage in the boot process is because it actually has a sort of um, very low level flash uh, utility, which allows you to flash the BIOS on this machine without anything else working. That's really cool. Um, imagine the situation where the BIOS was corrupted and you had to flash it, but you couldn't flash it because the machine wasn't working. Um, normally what we'd have to do with a BIOS is actually put a floppy disk in when it's running DOS already and then, you know, run some kind of command and then that would run a piece of software and then you would choose a file and it would flash the BIOS. Um, now in this case, this machine wasn't running. So if I had to do that, get into, into DOS and then, you know, flash the, the BIOS, I would basically be dead in the water. But this machine has a way of doing it without even uh, that running. So that was really cool. So I said to Jan, um, why does it need to decompress the BIOS? And he explained that what would happen is in these machines is that the BIOS would be stored in the 256K uh, and then it would be decompressed into main system memory. And this is called BIOS shadowing. The reason why this happens is, and you actually see this issue on an Amiga, the BIOS uh, is accessed directly by the CPU as the machine is running. And if the BIOS is in a slower um, area of uh, memory, that will actually slow down the execution of the CPU. And it was found over time, I guess, during the 90s that um, executing a BIOS like this, as the Amiga does, um, was slowing down performance quite drastically. So they decided to actually copy the BIOS from uh, some storage RAM. Um, during the boot sequence, it gets uh, copied and put into RAM. And to keep these chips at a reasonable size, they used to then decompress, they used to compress the BIOS so it would actually fit on the chip. It's pretty complicated, isn't it? So the machine starts up, um, the boot BIOS kicks in, uh, it checks the system RAM and says, oh, there's no system RAM. That's what my machine is doing. Beep, 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 put some RAM in, carries on. It says, okay, system RAM is there, checks to see if the floppy drive is there, floppy drive is there or not. Um, then it carries on. Don't forget it's not vital, so it doesn't actually error on the floppy drive. Um, it carries on and then it basically then goes to decompress the BIOS and then something is happening. Something. I didn't really know what that was. So there was a kind of um, techie bun fight on Vogon, so there are a few different viewpoints. Um, I had viewpoints from everywhere actually. I had one guy telling me that I needed to desolder this SRAM chips and you know that the SRAM chip was probably the problem. However, a number of people on Vogon said that they thought that the SRAM chip was probably used to store settings. I asked them, was the SRAM chip where any of the uh, BIOS data would be stored, you know, decompressed to? And they said almost certainly not because it's too small. Don't forget this BIOS chip is 256K. 
and it's decompressing, so therefore you would expect it to decompress into a bigger space, i.e. on the, the main system RAM. So most people felt that the 32K SRAM right here wasn't really the issue. I poured over a lot of data sheets, I read a lot of stuff, and then eventually I ended up in a situation and I said to the guys on Vogons, look, you know, I've got so many different viewpoints here that I don't really know what I'm meant to do next. I had a few people telling me that they felt that the system RAM was a problem. But as I said earlier, you know, uh, I don't think it is because the BIOS at no point is saying that there's a fault with the system RAM. It would say when it's missing, but it wouldn't say anything about it once it was actually inserted. So I felt that the system RAM was okay. So my next intuition was that the BIOS was corrupted. It was decompressing it and something was going wrong during the decompression process and it was maybe failing some kind of checksum internally and it was just wasn't doing anything else. But that didn't make sense because you'd think that if the BIOS was corrupted, that boot BIOS would detect that and then you'd have a bunch of beeps and it would tell you that there's a problem with the BIOS. But it wasn't, it was just stopping. But at the end of the day, I had no more feedback. I had to make a decision. Was I gonna start desoldering chips? It didn't really make sense because it, there didn't seem to be any chips that were faulty. I checked it with uh, you know magnifying glass, jeweler's goggles. I couldn't see any chips with any problems. So I decided that the least destructive thing that I could try and do, although there was a chance for that, it, you know, that it would go wrong, was to flash the BIOS. So this then brought me to another problem. I had tried to find the manual for, for this machine and I eventually found it on Yumpu. And then I found that when I tried to find the BIOS for this machine, I did a number of searches and I couldn't find it anywhere. I went on to the Wayback Machine, which is a website where old websites are archived especially when you go back to the 1990s. And I, I found both the ICL and the Fujitsu websites from the 1990s. I think I found them uh, around circa 98 and also 2000. And I thought, well, you know, it's only a few years after this machine came out. So it's quite likely so that, you know, support files will be actually on, on those websites. But I actually couldn't find any support area on the Fujitsu or the ICL websites. They were just mainly marketing materials and, you know, a little bit of fluff. This was like one day and then a couple of days went by and uh, I then asked people about it again and then I thought, you know, I've really got to find that BIOS because um, otherwise I'm just sunk basically. You know, this machine is uh, paperweight. So I did another search uh, and this time I went to the main Fujitsu website, the current one, the one which is available right now. And I thought, you know, I've got a cat's chance in hell of actually finding this BIOS. Went to the um, area where you do a search and I typed in Ergo Pro. And uh, I was a little bit despondent when it said it was too general uh, a search and I needed to be more specific. So I typed in Ergo Pro X453 and two items appeared in the list. <laughs> um, it showed the X453 and the X453S. So there must have been maybe a later model of this machine. But there it was in black and white, the X453 was there in the database. So I clicked on that link and it took me to a page and there were a number of tabs. And I looked in the first tab and I eventually found a uh, a utility um, and it was a DMP file dump and it was uh, 1.5 megabytes. So you can intuit from that that it's actually a, a dump of a floppy disk. And it said that it was a floppy disk BIOS flashing utility. So that was cool. Um, if it's a BIOS flashing utility, there's a good chance that on that disk there is actually a BIOS, at least one BIOS. But then I looked through the other tabs and eventually I found a BIOS specific tab. And in there, there was an EXE file which also was a BIOS file as well. So I downloaded those, those files. I didn't actually know what a, D, a DMP file was. So I asked Vogons again. And um, I think the advice that I followed in the end was that WinImage, which is an old application from years back, um, that would actually open up a DMP file. So I used that to decompress the DMP file. And there it was, it was actually a floppy disk. I then had to go onto Amazon and buy a three and a half inch floppy disk because I hadn't owned one of those apart from in a retro machine for what, 20, 20 plus years easily. Um, so that was quite a weird thing to do. Um, it arrived the next day, um, USB floppy disk drive, um, plugged that into my Windows PC, and then I extracted everything from that DMP file onto the floppy disk. And one of the files was a, I think it's an LDB file. It's a very specific file format that this machine expects the BIOS to be in. Um, and I read up about the low level uh, BIOS flashing utility, and that was a bit of a process actually. Um, but I had a BIOS file. 
I then checked the executable, and in there there was another uh, BIOS file as well. Um, the first one was, was um, I believe it was F, uh, dash F at the end, or under, underscore F, and the other one was K. So the other one in the .exe, the specific BIOS file, that appeared to be a later version of the BIOS, and on the flash utility disk, it had an F BIOS, which is an earlier version. Probably not the first one, obviously, because it's F. Um, so maybe you know by the time the machine was released, they released these utilities, and by that point, they got to the F version of the BIOS. So I decided to go for flashing using the earliest version just to get things rolling, um, because that would have been probably closest to what the BIOS was in this machine. And um, so the BIOS flashing uh, process is quite uh, hairy. There are two pads here, um, and what you do is you short those pads. I was actually using um, a packaging knife to do that. So I press the packaging knife on the two pads, and the manual tells you that you then turn on the machine. What happens then is when the machine turns on, it makes a specific uh, beep, beeping noise. I think it's quite a fast beep. Beep, 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 beep. That indicates that you've shorted the pads correctly. Uh, then you're meant to take the uh, short away with the machine still turned on. And the machine then goes into a mode where it's expecting you to plug in a floppy. Obviously, I had to plug a floppy disk in here. I made sure from my photographs that I took a while back that they were plugged in correctly, you know, the cable wasn't backwards. Luckily, the cable is keyed now. So it was obviously, you know, it, was, uh, it wasn't possible to actually plug it into the floppy drive backwards, which it was, uh, for instance, on Amigas. So I had the floppy disk here. I plugged in uh, the cable here, and I, I popped in the floppy disk. And uh, what happened next was um, a very, <laughs> very nervous few seconds. The uh, disk, di disk drive started to grunt. It was going in, 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 as it started to read the disk, which was a really good sign. Looked like the floppy disk drive worked. I mean, can you imagine if it didn't work? <laughs> that would have been horrible if I had to, you know, um, troubleshoot the, the floppy disk drive, but it was making noises. It sounded like it was working. And uh, the machine sat there for a while. I think it was about 20 to 30 seconds. And then I saw the post codes on this card change. It started to go through a flurry of codes that I hadn't seen before. <laughs> so that was a really good sign. Um, something was different. It wasn't stuck at code 61. So I waited. Uh, because it said in the manual that it could take up to two minutes to flash the BIOS. Uh, so I, what I really didn't want to do was obviously turn the machine off in the middle of that. Uh, and what I did was I actually waited for the postcode to be stable. It just stuck on, I think it was 42. Um, it stuck on postcode 42 for quite a long time. You know, I waited for like a minute and it was still on 42. And I thought, okay, it must be finished. Unplugged the machine, plugged in the VGA monitor here, and turned on the machine and waited for a few seconds. And the monitor came on, and this was what I saw. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, it was basically working again. I mean, basically working. It, there were lots of issues on the screen. It was complaining about the keyboard, and it was complaining about the battery, I think. And uh, it was complaining that the memory wasn't correct. Um, so I went and got my keyboard, turned the machine off, turned it back on again with a keyboard plugged in. And I waited for a while. And then when it got to that screen again, it went into the, I think I pressed a key and it went into the, uh, into the BIOS um, utility. It was a relatively simple BIOS utility. It actually has two areas. It has the user area and the admin area. The admin area turned out to be the area where most of the action was happening. Um, and I went into the different parts. And to be honest, there wasn't really a lot of things that I could change. I think I could turn the CPU cache on and off. It was off by default. Um, the hard disk was set to be automatic. Uh, I didn't bother changing the time because at this point I didn't really care about the time. Um, and that was about it, really. I checked about some other settings. There was, I had the ability to change PCI and things like that. And there was nothing really that sh stood out that I should be at this point trying to um, turn on or off. Um, everything seemed to be pretty good. So I saved the BIOS. Uh, and the machine rebooted. And when it rebooted, uh, this is what I saw after about two minutes. <laughs> so there we are. Uh, the machine is working again. And it actually does boot back into Windows 98. 
Now, when I got the machine, I never actually saw it boot into Windows 98 because when I tested it at the time, I didn't have a keyboard plugged in. I don't think it was producing any BIOS errors at that point. It was all set up correctly. Whoever sold it to me must have obviously checked that. But obviously, I didn't want to really go off and get a keyboard when it was, you know, it was basically booting up and complaining that a keyboard wasn't plugged in. And I didn't have a keyboard plugged in, so it was working, right? And it was at that point I then took the machine off and decided to take it apart and wash it and so on and so forth. And that's where we found ourselves at the beginning of this video. So the machine is working again. Uh, what else did we find? Well, a couple of days later, um, after this happened, the 100 megahertz uh, oscilloscope turned up. And I then went through the process of testing the clocks again. Because I thought, well, you know, I've spent £100 on this oscilloscope. Sorry, £255 on this oscilloscope. I may as well actually use it and see, you know, is it correct, what I was seeing? Almost certainly not, obviously, because the machine's working. So it'd be very, very weird if the strange uh, clock speeds that I was seeing were, were correct. But I had to check it, right? So the first thing I did was I checked the input uh, clocks on the uh, clock chip. Working fine. I, you know, I saw the same speed as I was seeing with the 25 megahertz scope. Then I went to the 24 uh, megahertz uh, clock out for the USB, 24 megahertz as well. That was completely expected. But what was different was when I went to the 48 megahertz uh, clock for the USB, it was actually showing 48 megahertz. And of course, then I went on and I tested out the 66 megahertz that I should be seeing on the rest of the chips sorry, on the rest of the pins, and yes, 66 megahertz. So what I can conclude from that is that if you're going to uh, measure any clock speeds over the rate, the rated uh, level of a, an oscilloscope, you're going to get possibly weird results. And that's kind of expected, but honestly, I'd never owned uh, an oscilloscope until recently, so I didn't know if that was a thing or not. Maybe it can only show, you know, the waveform for 25 mega megahertz, but it has more tolerance than actually recording it. It turns out it does, as you know, has a little bit more tolerance. But really, once you get above the rated speed, you, you know, you're going to go into un uncharted territory, and you you're probably going to get back unreliable results that you shouldn't really uh, rely on, which I didn't. So yeah, that was that. What else did I learn? Well, um, if you're if you have a broken PC, especially one of these machines where you don't have these postcodes being displayed on the motherboard, and that's not really that common in this era. It wasn't a thing. I guess it was in the 2000s that you had higher-end motherboards. I mean, don't forget this was a higher-end motherboard in its day. But in the 2000s, you probably get higher-end motherboards where they start to put these uh, postcodes um, uh, displays actually on the motherboard. I mean, my current PC does. But it wasn't a thing back in the 90s especially, and if you go earlier as well. So if you're going to work on a machine um, of this era or earlier, then I definitely think one of these uh, post uh, code cards is really a must. Um, so yeah, if you are going to do that, definitely watch the previous video where I explain it um, in a little bit more detail because it's quite useful to understand how it works um, if you are going to buy one. And I definitely recommend getting one. I mean, it was only £12. Um, and in the end, it was crucial to actually working out what was wrong with, with this machine. If I didn't know that the BIOS decompression wasn't working, I wouldn't have tried to flash the BIOS and that wouldn't have worked and I wouldn't have a working machine again. So that's definitely um, a big learning thing about this. I think, you know, at the end of the day, what it proves is it's tools for the job. If you don't have the tools for the job, you're going to have a hard time working things out. Now, you might think to me yourself, why didn't you buy this before you even bought the machine, Chris? Well, the answer is I didn't expect it to break. Um, once it had broken, I then watched a number of videos to learn how to, you know, diagnose what the problem is with a sort of PC, 486 Pentium era PC. And during those videos, it became obvious that the star of the show time and time again was one of these cards. So I ordered one almost immediately. But the problem was the vendor on eBay, they took their time and it took over a week for this to arrive. And in the meantime, I had to sort of plow on and see if I could work out what was going on. And that's what I did. I used my multimeter, I used my oscilloscope, my 25 megahertz one, to try and look at things. And eventually, you know, I reached a bit of a dead end, really. It, it, but there was some, you know, there were some conclusions from that week. I did sort of realize that I thought that the clocks were basically working. I realized, you know, the, P, the, the actual CPU was probably working fine. The RAM seemed to be okay. 
you know, so I did have some conclusions. And basically, by the time this card turned up, I was expecting it probably to work. I would have been shocked if I turned it on and I saw the sort of um, the snake eyes of death. And when I did turn it on, and I saw that first postcode where it said 25, that validated what I thought, which was that the BIOS was saying correctly that the RAM was not plugged in. Then when you plugged in the RAM, and it ran through a, a slightly longer sequence, and then it was saying 61, that was the mystery. What was 61? What did it mean? Now, the manual obviously was crucial to that. And this machine has its own BIOS. So the problem is, you can't go to a generic uh, vendor uh, and uh, BIOS and have a look uh, for what the postcodes are for this machine. I had to have the actual correct manual for this machine because it's an ICL BIOS. So I had the manual, I compared it, and then that gave me the solid information that I needed. If I'd made the mistake of thinking that it was another type of BIOS, maybe like an award BIOS or um, Phoenix BIOS or things like that, I would have been, you know, basically going off in completely the wrong direction. You've got to match up the correct BIOS postcodes with the actual BIOS that you have, obviously. So that 61 uh, code was vital. It told me that the BIOS was decompressing and it was then not working. That then led me to flashing the BIOS and that then got me back onto solid ground and a working machine. Wonderful. What am I going to do next? Okay, so in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to actually start to reassemble this machine. I have a number of things planned uh, to um, enhance it. There are various cards that need to be plugged back in. There's um, an Ethernet card here. There are the COM ports which I unplugged. I mean, this, this machine's been stripped down to nothing, right? Um, I bought a Matrox Millennium graphics card, which I really haven't really done anything with yet. The reason for that is because you have to have the drivers. This is the Windows 95, Windows 98 era when drivers were a bit of a nightmare. So before I even think about installing that Millennium card, I need to make sure that I have the correct drivers for it. So I need to do a little bit of research to actually find those. I, um, that is a, a PCI card, so that will go up here. Um, I also have uh, a rather cool, uh, I think it's an Adaptex SCSI card. What I would like to do with this machine in the future is to replace the IDE drive with a SCSI drive. That's going to be for the future because I can't really afford the cost of the Blue SCSI for now. I think they've gone up quite a lot. They're like 70 pounds, which is pretty extortionate, really. When you think I bought this machine for 80 <laughs> and the, um, the modern SCSI, you know, emulation card is actually almost as expensive as the entire machine. But there we are, you know, they have to be manufactured and that's the going price. Um, so in the meantime, what I'm thinking of doing is I've got a um, IDE to compact flash adapter. This hard drive at this point is what, 26 years old? It works fine, doesn't make any weird noises, uh, clicks away really nice and cleanly. So I think the hard drive is actually fine. However, I think it's a good thing to back it up anyway. So I'm gonna try and copy all the data off it and put it onto my compact flash. And once I've done that, what I plan to do is, is to delete all the user's data because there is actually a lot of user data left on that hard drive. And once I've done that on the compact flash, I will then try and install the Matrox Millennium graphics card, and I will then install the SCSI card and so on. So um, there's also things like, for instance, the fan, which needs to go here. There's a, another one of these fans, a little bit larger, which is going to go, I think, over here. Um, so there's quite a lot of stuff which I have planned for this machine to basically get it working and be future-proof and take it to the next level. Hopefully, when I can put a SCSI hard drive in this, in this it's going to really make it fly. And I can put a really massive um, hard drive in it then. I'm thinking about installing um, the files, which are uh, Exodos files, which is like, I think it's, I don't know, five gigabytes or 500 gigabytes of um, video games from the 1990s. I'd love to have this machine be a sort of, a, you know, an amazing um, DOS and Windows gaming machine. It may be a little bit too further along, you know, because it's a Pentium to do DOS. Um, but it will be at least, you know, a Windows 98, Windows 95 era uh, gaming machine, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, that's what I have planned for it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it really for this video. Hopefully uh, you enjoyed this saga um, in getting this machine fixed. And uh, if you did, then please click on the like button because it really helps the channel to grow. If you don't click the like button, the channel just won't grow. You know, people won't get to see these videos because YouTube won't actually put these in front of users. 
Um, and if you did like the video, then please subscribe because I'd really love you to see you back in the channel again and enjoying you know, the next video in the series. Um, so yeah, please become part of uh, the Retronaut uh, channel and help it grow in the future. Hope you enjoyed this video and uh, I hope to see you in the next one where we put this all back together and we get ourselves back to a functioning Windows 98 machine from the Pentium era. Um, and it's going to be a wonderful thing to uh, do that. So yeah, hope to see you there. Until then, take care.